So welcome to the Jewish Arts and Open Studios program. The series is curated and hosted by Judy Joseph and myself. Program advisor is Jewish Art Salon director, Yona Berger. Team members are Hannah Elias and Cheslin Ametto. Please, if you have uh, questions to the artist presenters, put it in the chat. Back to you, Judy. Thank you, Dorit. Uh, welcome to everyone. The Open Studios program features artists who are members of the Jewish Art Salon and responded to a call for art or were invited. This is the last program in this series, Creativity in an Uncertain Time. In this series, we've produced 13 programs featuring over 45 presenting artists and, more, and we had more than 1400 viewer participants. It was curated and hosted by Dorit jordan Dotan, and myself. Uh, please watch your inbox uh, and the Jewish Art Salon website for dates for our next series, After the Flood Regenesis. We received many strong submissions and Dorit and I will be contacting all of the artists who submitted shortly. The new series will begin in May and the dates will be announced soon. Our featured artists today are Barrett Engen and Johanan Petrovsky Stern. Our third artist, Shoshana Brombacher, unfortunately will not be able to present today. Her mother passed away just a few days ago. Despite her loss, Shoshana still managed to record her presentation for us, but unfortunately there were technical problems with the file and we are unable to show it. We will invite her back in the next series when she can be with us in person slash on Zoom. Uh, our condolences go out to Shoshana and her family. Uh, today's artists, Barrett and Yochanan, both have bio biographical similarities in that they are both uh, products of Europe. They grew up in Europe, uh, but their work is quite different. Um, they both came to Judaism as adults. Both have immersed themselves in Jewish studies, including uh, Hebrew and Yiddish. Uh, Barrett's work as a weaver springs from the Norwegian tradition of weaving, while her content is mostly Jewish. Yohanan's visual art is influenced by folk art that he saw growing up in Ukraine and also fine art and is full of Bible and Yiddish folk tales. Barrett's work has the spare reserved refinement of the Scandinavian aesthetic, while Yochanan's is exuberant, brightly colored and emotional. Jewish culture for them is viewed a bit more objectively and uniquely than it is for those of us for whom it was the default environment. And this adds a level of cultural richness and complexity to their work which appears deceptively simple. For both of them, their work is self-expression, but it's also a love letter to Jewish culture and ideas. Um, here is Dorit. Dorit will introduce Barrett. Shalom okay. to you all. And first I'd like to send our friend Shoshana Bumbacher my deep condolences. In our last Creativity in Uncertain Time session. I'd like to thank the Jewish Art Salon and Yona Berber for inviting Judith and I to co-curate and host this program. Learning how to curate and run a virtual Zoom program was challenging. Judith and I have online curatorial meetings. We learn as we go and explore the benefits of the virtual era. We have been flooded with emails from artists who expressed how much they enjoy the programs and how important it is to have this platform to stay connected and share their creativity. Curators of museums and galleries and Jewish magazines regularly attend the sessions. Judith and I will be happy to answer the questions about our co-curating work if time allows, as we have a little more time today. Our first presenter is my dear friend, Barrett Engen. She began weaving as a child in Norway and now practices this ancient craft, the centuries old tradition of expounding on Jewish texts. Her ongoing project, Weft and Drush, weaving a thousand Jewish tapestries began in 2007, consists to date of about 600 pieces. She compares her small scale linen yarn tapestries to Japanese haiku formerly concentrated by miniature size 
imagistic and focused yet elusive. Her work has been shown in solo and group shows, including exhibition at the Spurtus Institute in Chicago in 2012 and 13, and the Janice Char Charach Gallery of the JCC of Metropolitan Detroit in 2018. Her work is part of the permanent collection of the Chicago History Museum and has been featured in Lilith Magazine. A 10 piece commission on the Sinai story permanently installed at the interest of sanctuary of Temple Heart Zion in River Forest, Illinois in 2020. She is co-editor of Out of the Narrows, the artist's Haggadah 2021. Berit, you can share your screen and go ahead. Um, I showed the tapestries in a solo exhibit at the Oak Park Public Library last spring. But unfortunately, the library closed 10 days after the opening because of COVID. The tapestries are woven to the verses that bring the narrative forward and the titles are quotes from the text. And it happened in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And they came to the plains of Moab, and they were there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Mahlon and Kilian died as well. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law farewell. But Ruth clung to her. For wherever you go, I will go. Your people is my people. And it happened as they came to Bethlehem that the whole town was astir over them and the women said, is this Naomi? And Ruth went and came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. I am Ruth, your servant. May you spread your garment over your servant. And all the people who were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. And Boaz took Ruth the Moabite and she became his wife and he came to bed with her. And Naomi took the child and placed him in her lap and became a nurse for him. And this is the lineage of Peretz. Peretz begot her son, and just begot David. So I like the intimacy of small, finely woven pictures. One sees and experiences fiber, colors, technique, structure, uh, and image all in the same moment. I also like reading stories and the small format lends itself well to that, especially time-wise, even if it takes me five to six days to completely finish one tapestry. These tapestries here are about nine by eight inches. So this series is viewed right to left, like reading Hebrew script that shows three basic colors. All but one of the tapestries have a plain background with only one shape or figure, and the shape consists of only two colors. This very short book is easily read in 30 minutes, but in spite of lacking details and elaboration, it is far from minimal in its themes. There is famine, migration, tribal intermarriage, hostility towards foreigners, early deaths of husbands, return to homeland, women finding paths of survival, in-law relationships, and a foreigner being accepted but overlooked, and finally, her major contribution to her newly chosen culture and people. Needless to say, the book is quite relevant in our time, and that is an aspect I really love about biblical text. So last spring, I was invited by a member of the Jewish Arts Salon, Susan Turner of Winnipeg, Manitoba, to participate in an online group exhibition on the theme of roundness. Her project was an early response to the isolation and anxiety of the pandemic, and a call for artists to reflect through one piece of artwork on roundness in light of the virus. 
And then iteration of this online exhibition will be installed in Winnipeg this summer. And I want to just say it so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Susan. I don't know if you're here, but anyway, I really appreciate this. And uh, this was uh, one of these things that happened because of COVID. So I choose Charles to weave the virus itself, which uh, appeared so beautiful on TV screens day after day in the beginning of the virus. It was purplish and pink, and I don't remember exactly. Here I wove it as a glass bowl, a roundish bowl, and the red color symbolizes our lives. But I then wove a story based on a comforting email from our rabbi to the congregation, to our congregation, which told a tale about King Solomon's mood swings and the lesson he learned that this too shall pass. And uh, I, like I said, I like weaving in stories. And here you can see the tapestry, the sneaky intruder. Here the sneaky intruder attacks us. Here we conquer them, intruder. And uh, that's the virus, but I wanted something about life before virus and the beauty of life after. So I started weaving this tapestry and uh, it has these dark green shapes. And as I was weaving, they remind me of fishes jumping in Lake Michigan when I'm swimming. So there I had the title, fish I jump in and then I had the image for the last tapestry and the cotton grows high and the living is easy. However, the um, title of this last tapestry is uh, taking care of our tomorrow. Um, so then let's see here. Um, just, okay. So as things started to seriously shut down last spring, I started a series based on three true stories of isolation. Unlike our story of COVID, they took place in darkness and silence. And I will begin with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most important archeological find of the 21st century. And for years, I want to weave the ceramic jars that the scrolls were stored in for about two millennia. Here they are seen from inside the cave in which they were discovered as they are leaving Qumran, the site in the Judean desert where they were miraculously found on the day, one day by shepherds. I then decided I want to read more of the stories. So, here it starts, I kind of Im Im imagine I'm inside in this cave, it's dark, I look out up in the sky and 2000 empty years pass by the Dead Sea. One day a goat ran up a cliff. Leaning against each other, the jar stared at the shepherd. New morning in Jerusalem. And here is the series. And the last tapestry. Let's see. There's the, ah, here we are. Um, uh, depicts the famous museum in Jerusalem, the shrine of the book, which was built for storing the scrolls. It's in the shape of a ceramic jar lid, sort of honoring the jars that were made specifically in Qumran uh, for these scrolls. They are especially um, tall and thin and were unlike any other uh, jars that were made in that location. So the next story is about the Cairo Genisa and the most important archeological find of the 20th century. It documents several hundred years of Jewish life in North Africa and the Mediterranean in medieval times. Everything from holy and philosophical writing to shopping list. And Rabbi Salman Schechter, who lived in Cambridge in England at the time, heard rumors of the Genisa 
which is a storage room in a synagogue for written documents awaiting formal burial. The Cairo Geniza had not been emptied for several hundreds of years, and this rumor started to spread uh, through Europe that there was something there to be found. So he rushed down there, down to this uh, country far away by the River Nile in Cairo, the old city. Inside the Ben Ezra synagogue, on the sanctuary wall high up, in the dark and dusty attic, the treasure. And then we're back in England, cascading leaves and letters in Cambridge. So I find it fascinating how these stories of how uh, the, the documents were stored or how they were left or how they were ignored or how they were hidden, how they were forgotten about and then how they were found and the, how they have similarities and yet are quite different. And I've used weeping willows in uh, other uh, tapestries as well. So I had it in the Cambridge tapestry and here it is uh, in two of my tapestries on the Book of Lamentations. And the uh, willow tree for me is not just, I think it's beautiful and cascading, but the leaves, the, at least the way I like weaving them, they remind me of the basic shape of uh, Hebrew letters. And uh, so now Hebrew letter originally came from above, from God, and uh, uh, scrolls are written, in the scrolls the Hebrew letters are written from top with a downward motion unlike our handwriting. Um, and here I use the same image in my series on the sound by the rivers of Babylon, will be sat and wept. And the third story is from the underground archive in, of the Warsaw ghetto during and after the war. Um, the archive was collected by people knowing they were going to be sent to the camps and the, it documents the extermination of the Polish Jewry. They collected uh, documents, there were a group of 70 people in uh, milk uh, cans, three milk cans and 10 uh, metal um, uh, baskets or cases. And um, I would like to, uh, okay, so here it starts uh, with this tapestry, hiding history as the ghetto walls are falling. So they decided to, uh, a, a group of about 70 people to collect documents and hide them so that after the war, and they knew they were gonna die, but so that after the war, the Jews of the Warsaw ghetto would have a voice and that there would be documentation of the war from a point, from the point of view of the Jews. And then 10 metal boxes and three cans, the bird of morning is waiting. So this is uh, the Shiva bird, oops, sorry. Um, how do I get back up? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, hey. yeah, the Shiva bird, um, uh, the, the bird of morning, that's from a poem by the Yiddish poet Itzik it's Manger, who survived the war and returned to Warsaw, which was at the time before the war was the center of Yiddish culture in Europe. And, um, and there was nothing left. And uh, he talks about the Shiva bird, the bird of morning flying around. And I've used that image here. The, the Shiva bird is sitting, perhaps. Uh, sorry about that, waiting. And here, the Shiva Feugel circles the Varsha ghetto. I'm kind of flying up towards God. And this is where ghetto is flattened. The deafening weight of nothing left. And here you can see I wove even the Shiva bird being, uh, yeah, not being alive anymore. 
and then it uh, this creates uh, we dug up uh, a few years after the war. It was only one survivor who knew where they were uh, hidden, and uh, uh, the ghetto had been flattened. So it was a miracle that he could find some of them. And they're now on display in a beautiful museum. And uh, But I've opened the museum. This uh, tapestry is called Anticipating Death on Curated Display. This tapestry is woven um, kind of in um, not too happy of color in the background. You can see the ubiquitous birch tree, the white trees, they're beautiful. But uh, there is a sense of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. And um, um, when I was in Krakow, I was quite shocked uh, by what I heard and what I saw and what I experienced. So anyway, that's part of the story in this tapestry. Uh, Barrett, I just want yes. to give you a time heads mm -hmm. up. It's about 14 and a half minutes. Yeah. So uh, I try and finish within two minutes. Is that what you're saying? Uh, you're well, talking? you're over by a, a, a couple minutes, but so yeah, a yeah, couple minutes. OK, so I will uh, do this uh, fast. This is, uh, I included a couple of tapestries in black and white because they're on the um, the, the, the flyer for this event, Untan Tokev, uh, Pray Without Prey, Who by Strangulation. So this is from Who Shall Live and Who Shall Die, the Yom Kippur prayer. And this is kind of relevant to COVID. Um, it is the Who Shall... Uh, and last, our children, who shall live and who shall die. But I know I'm supposed to end it on a happy note, so I'm going to go to the Haggadah that I co-edited, that Dorit mentioned. And this came really out of the COVID experience. Then at the very end, uh, I use Scandinavian linen yarn. I have about 150 spools. It's high quality uh, yarn for weaving artwork. All I need, apart from that, is a frame and a fork, and then I need good shoes to keep my thinking straight. And I need daylight, which you can see is coming in from the side there. And this uh, picture was taken about, uh, I was 26 at the time, so it's 40 years ago, and I had already been weaving then since I was 14. Okay, that's it. Mm, thank you. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you so much, Barrett. And what a stupendous uh, presentation and um, you have so much work that I know that it was an incredible challenge for you to fit it all into uh, this tiny time constraint. But I have to say that sometimes um, it helps us kind of distill our work when we have a limited time, you know, really pick out the best, which I, I can't, I don't know, all of your work is the best. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of praise and comments in the in the uh, chat, and I noticed that Bruria had a question for you. So Bruria Finkel, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, hi, thank you. My question was that uh, I I waited for the last uh, slide to say the technique. Uh, you didn't talk much about it, and you showed us the sizes. Do you mm -hmm. make them bigger than that? Do you have bigger frames? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about your technique? Yeah, so it is uh, first about technique. It's very hard to show it on the screen in a short presentation. If yeah. you want to, I'm inviting you to a presentation I will give in fall for the Weaver's Guild of Chicago. It's uh, called uh, Techniques and Expression from 600 Tapestries, because there I can really talk more about it. But the most important thing to know about weaving is that you make the cloth as you make the image, unlike embroidery, where you have the cloth and you can start stitching and you can go here and there and some painting, I can go here and there. I have to build it all up from the bottom. I usually turn my tapestry sideways. So the fringes are on the sides instead of top and bottom when I'm done. And um, 
uh, then what, uh, what what was the last part of your question again how large yeah, do I make them bigger so in this project they're all small uh, like uh, nine by seven inches but yes I have made bigger and I have a beautiful huge American tapestry loom in walnut tree handmade in Oregon I don't use it it makes me look very interesting but I don't use it right now I can't part with it though <laughs> wonderful <laughs> Thank you so much. It was amazing. And I love your work and I know your work in person. And I would like to, to hear a little bit. I mean, I know about it too, but maybe other people want to hear a little bit about your intense project of our Haggadah. Yeah, thank you for asking. So that started so after uh, Haggadah last year, we started to think, three of us, we want to make an artist Haggadah. And three of us, we are co-founders and members of uh, Jack, Jewish Artist uh, Collective uh, Chicago. And, um, uh, and uh, we're about 10 to 11 members, and three of us really wanted to do this. And, uh, it was a little bit back and forth because it is a big project and it doesn't seem like that in a way now that we can go to Haggadot.com and just copy and paste, but somehow one has to know what one is doing and uh, because when things go on print, everything changes. When you're responsible, really your name is there on a printed document. So anyway, in August, September, we started seriously, the three of us, to um, work, uh, ha we have different fields of uh, responsibility. And uh, we, since December 20th, we've just been working like crazy until Passover. Uh, and we have incorporated um, a lot of artwork from members of our group. And uh, a lot of attention is paid to how to present the text beautifully and logically because the Haggadah is somehow so whimsical and yet there is logic to it and there are several structures and they overlap and a little crazy and uh, Carol uh, uh, Lesberg, she did a wonderful job at that. Uh, who is a graphic designer, she took care of that, Susan Dickman took care of the English part translation, which also is extremely important. And uh, I was um, in charge of overlooking that all the text elements that are there, they had the right weight visually, textually, and uh, yeah, sort of making it work. <laughs> well, Barrett, there are a couple more questions about your weaving. So let's, yeah. let's uh, go back to that. So Susie Dessel, would you like to unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? Sure, thank you, Barrett. Your work is, is just quite splendid. Um, my question is about the series of the Geniza. Yeah. In that one, you chose imagery that was quite representational mm -hmm. um, as compared to the other pieces. And I wonder what was behind that um, decision. Yeah. Uh, part of that uh, is that I was in Egypt three times when I was um, in my early 20s. And uh, I remember flying into Cairo and seeing the pyramids. And you know, they're so simple. They're beautiful geometrical shapes, but they're pretty simple. I didn't think it was gonna be look like very much, but flying in and over them and seeing them there in the desert. And then, uh, uh, yeah, the desert being on one side and Cairo on the other, it was, such a powerful sight. I wanted to incorporate that a little. Also, when I was in Egypt, it was my early 20s, I was very taken by the Islamic culture. And uh, so I wore these mosques and the minarets. I wanted Cairo at night, old Cairo. And uh, once I decided that I wanted it more, um, so you could recognize buildings and places. It, I chose uh, that to be uh, part of uh, the series. So I have about 75 uh, uh, series on various aspects of Judaism and I need to 
make them and I want to make them different. Um, and of course, the, the things that is overlapping, the one thing that connect them is really my use of linen yarn. Thank you, Barrett. We do have a couple more questions for you, but I, I want to make sure that we have equal time mm -hmm. for Jochenan. So um, we can save those questions till the end. And thanks Good. again. Thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to introduce Jochenan petrovsky Sterren. And I knew Jochenan for several years as a wonderful professor and teacher before I even knew that he was an artist. It's not even fair. <laughs> Wait till you hear all of his background. Um, Jochenan Petrovsky Stern is the Crown Family Professor at the Jewish History Department, Northwestern University, where he teaches early modern and modern Jewish history and culture with a focus on Eastern Europe. He earned a PhD from Moscow University in comparative literature and a PhD from Brandeis University in modern Jewish history. His long but by no means straight itinerary brought him from Ukraine to the United States. And before he discovered his Jewish roots, he practiced Greek Orthodoxy, Zen Buddhism, Anglo-Catholicism, and taught Spanish and Latin American literature from Cervantes to Garcia Marquez. He extensively uses his experience as a scholar in his art to challenge what we think we know, understand, and believe. His artistic influences are Russian avant-garde, Ukrainian folk art, and Polish political poster art. He has had solo exhibitions of his art at the Spertus Institute in Chicago, the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art of Chicago, the Ukrainian Museum, New York, and Wojnitsky Art Gallery in Lviv, Ukraine. And Jochenan, go ahead and share your screen and show us your wonderful work. Um, thank you very much, Dorit and Judith. Do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, I consider it the um, topic of our today's conversation as a question, as a personal question. So how do we make art in an uncertain time? And what does it mean to be making art in an uncertain time? And when I was thinking about this question, I realized that um, uh, many, many years ago, when um, I started to work in the studio of uh, uh, David Miretsky, um, my uh, mentor in Kiev uh, back then in the 1970s. Um, I also started my work in the uncertain times because um, uh, the person who is on your right hand side, uh, you know, my mentor uh, was arrested for participating in an unauthorized rally um, um, at the site of a major Jewish massacre in Ukraine. And um, so I was finishing my um, um, uh, picture um, uh, on your left-hand side, uh, which is called just Pirates. Um, uh, I was working on it uh, when my mentor was under arrest. Um, a couple of years uh, later, um, uh, my um, uh, dad and I were in a fight and I was kicked out from the house. Um, um, I spent time um, in the house of my friend and uh, just as a token of appreciation, I decided I will paint a fresco um, on, his, um, on his wall. Uh, so on the right hand side, me in a very uncertain time of me when I'm just um, kind of orphaned myself um, and uh, exiled myself out of the house of the parents. So I am um, uh, creating um, uh, a picture on, um, uh, on the wall. Uh, which is um, which is a long piece. It's about uh, one, two, three, four, uh, four and a half meters to a meter and a half. You can translate it in feet, um, uh, uh, just multiplying to three. Um, so um, that is another um, example of uh, me um, creating art in uncertain time. And uh, uh, penultimate uh, pre-story in my story is when uh, when I was on the brink of not getting to um, a grad school in 1984 in Moscow and instead I was uh, almost sent to the um, uh, Soviet army and I had to serve in Afghanistan so um, and um, uh, prefiguring that I might be fighting for the uh, imperialist interests of the Soviet Union in uh, Central Asia, um, I turned to, um, again, Ukrainian folk art, and I did this um, eye beast, 
uh, the last thing I did before 20 years being artistically silent, so to say. Um, uh, my uh, uh, next story um, starts uh, exactly in the time of a very great uncertainty when I am uh, almost denied tenure at Northwestern University and ruining my career. It didn't happen, uh, but, uh, but I was uh, really in the situation when I was uh, on the brink of losing my job. And I turned to um, uh, my old uh, uh, you know, fancy Ukrainian folk tales, but at that time I decided to use my Jewish and Slavic uh, backgrounds um, and fuse them together. Um, so I thought that I will be creating something like a midrash on Slavic tales. So I believe uh, many of you might know the story of uh, um, uh, the um, Slavic folk tale about a, an old man who goes to the sea, catches a uh, goldfish, and the goldfish uh, tells him, just let me go, I'll fulfill your wish. And um, and it repeats many, many times, and the wishes that the man um, uh, articulates to this fish are about the desires of his uh, greedy and selfish uh, wife. Um, uh, so, uh, in my story, uh, the man and his uh, and his wife uh, um, are uh, not uh, Slavs living at the uh, 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 seashore, but rather, uh, you know, Jews, and Jews do not rely on the miracle. So uh, the old man tells the fish, why do I need uh, you, why do I need to, to trust you and uh, fulfill my wishes? I'd rather need um, a, a gefilte fish uh, for my uh, Sabbath uh, um, um, dinner, and he takes this golden fish and makes her into a golden gefilte fish. So uh, this is the kind of things I was inventing, and I didn't know at the time that um, uh, these inventions that uh, really started to um, uh, jump out of my mind and, and, and help me to create one image after another, I didn't know that they will bring me to something uh, much more substantial. Um, at certain point, um, I realized that, um, you know, um, I have like 30, 40, 50 uh, canvases, uh, 12 to 18, 20 to 25 um, inches. Um, uh, let me try something different. And um, I decided to turn uh, to um, what um, Barrett uh, discovered, a very succinct palette um, to uh, two, three, maybe maximum four basic colors. I had to figure out what these colors would be about. Um, I was um, very much interested in uh, what they call in East Europe the avant-garde vocabulary. So this is one of the posters um, of uh, the Soviet avant-garde of the 1920s, early 1920s. Um, and I was interested in the succinct uh, visual language um, of uh, this avant-garde trend um, of its um, uh, very clear uh, forms and shapes. But I was also interested in anti, in creating something that I called later anti-avant-garde symbolism. Avant-garde is uh, praising and celebrating um, uh, violence, class struggle, um, uh, unification of um, everything and everybody. I was more interested in sophisticated messages, in anti-violence message, and something like that. But I did like the language of avant-garde, especially its succinct palette. And I decided I'll take three colors and I'll create something on the Jewish theme. And I did this picture, which I called pogrom in a shtetl, uh, like uh, the image of violence um, against a uh, 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 small Jewish community somewhere in Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, wherever. And um, I used three basic colors, um, uh, creating this uh, symbolic vision of uh, violence and uh, disassociating myself uh, from it. And when I showed this uh, the, this canvas uh, to to my dad, who is a special who was a specialist in uh, East European Jewish history, cultural literature, he told me this is the best thing I did. Well, it took me approximately a year to understand that what I did is a discovery. And I decided then after a year of continuing to do my um, multicolored works to turn to red, black, and white. And uh, since that time, I am uh, exploring um, uh, this uh, very much succinct palette of three colors, trying to uh, make it more and more sophisticated. Um, oh, by, uh, let's say 2009, um, 
uh, when I finally got through my uncertain times, got my tenure, got my uh, endowed professorship at Northwestern, um, I decided to have some more time. So I started to produce about 35, 30 to 35 canvases per year, um, uh, imitating Ukrainian folk art, bringing Ukrainian folk art images together with the Russian avant-garde style and with the messages of Polish political poster. Why this political poster? Because in the 1960s, 1970s, Polish political poster was very much anti-imperialist, um, 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 undermining um, kind of a message uh, that conveyed uh, the mass protest um, against Soviet occupation um, and against uh, the abuses of the totalitarian system. Um, uh, so um, I did this um, canvas Jewish luck um, after visiting um, um, Alt Neue Galerie um, in um, uh, uh, in Altanoi Pinakothek in, in Munich. Um, so uh, why Jews have um, uh, Amsterdam looks um, and uh, shtetl hats um, uh, mixing um, uh, Dutch and Ukrainian uh, Jewish imagery, I don't know, maybe you know. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to show uh, by doing what I was doing is that uh, Jews are always uh, celebrating and um, being joyous. Uh, in most cases, uh, in the times when they are negligent about their very uncertain situation, when they are in suspense, where there is, uh, when they are surrounded by violence that uh, is uh, waiting uh, uh, for them, uh, but is not necessarily unfolding uh, in front of their eyes. It's somewhere on the back. So when people come up to this um, canvas, um, they start looking at the white figures because, you know, they are catchy. Um, and uh, when they step uh, back uh, two, three, four uh, steps, they realize uh, what is going on at the perimeter. And the perimeter, together with the what is inside, creates kind of a, um, a tension of a meaning, uh, tension as a meaning, uh, that uh, is um, in the focus of my uh, attention. Um, uh, what I am uh, doing in, um, when I'm creating my uh, artistic works, uh, uh, including that one, which is called Hitler in Hell, um, uh, I um, usually create sketches uh, and I destroy sketches. I say sketches and no sketches, meaning that I make my hand remember what um, I'm trying to uh, put on canvas. And unless my hand remembers uh, the visual material that I need, um, I'm destroying the sketches. Once I think I know what I'm doing, um, I um, put a thick um, gesso, thick layer of gesso on canvas. Um, when it dries out, I do um, pencil sketching uh, of what I need to put on canvas. Um, uh, then I cover this uh, pencil sketch with another layer of white zinc uh, so that I would not see even the traces of pencil. So it'll be just a plain black, uh, plain white uh, surface. And uh, uh, then I put uh, red cadmium, medium hue, uh, the, the medium hue, this is what I usually uh, use for red and uh, Mars black. Um, in most cases it is, um, heavy body golden colors. Um, or golden is a company that produces this um, acrylic colors that um, um, uh, look like uh, oil. Uh, when they dry out, you can touch the surface. It creates um, a kind of a, a 3D surface. Um, and uh, you, you do see that it is um, uh, like um, oil cover, although it is definitely acrylic. Um, uh, so meaning that um, I am trying to uh, create the painting only when I uh, do know very well what I'm doing. So uh, improvisation um, is uh, somehow uh, playing itself out uh, when I'm creating things, especially in details, uh, which I do not put on canvas uh, um, and do not even plan uh, when I'm sketching things, but they, but the details, um, of course, is something that um, I improvise um, at the very last moment. So Hitler in hell, 
um, uh, when we are thinking about the punishment for the uh, perpetrators of genocide uh, and uh, the uh, people who masterminded the Holocaust, I'm thinking about those three, um, those four who are, I believe, uh, somewhat recognizable, Hitler, uh, Goebbels, um, um, uh, Goering, and, and Himmler, um, uh, whom I place in the hell, and I make them learn Hebrew, eat matzah, wear talis, and be covered with yarmulke. So I believe if you think about the worst punishment for those um, uh, for those schmucks, uh, the, uh, what I'm creating for them um, um, is something that cannot be worse. You can place them as Dante does in the Cotsitus, uh, this um, ice circle um, at the very bottom of the ninth um, uh, circle of hell and make devil chew them, but I think it would not be as painful for them as uh, this particular punishment. Um, when I am um, working on this um, uh, plots, I'm always uh, thinking that I'm creating a kind of an apocrypha. That is to say, I take very well-known myths, um, ideological, biblical, um, um, textual, literary, and I put them upside down. Um, and it is not just uh, the um, um, intent to put myths upside down, but rather it is an intent uh, to undermine what we uh, know uh, about. And uh, of course, uh, we very mo often use myths to explain things. Uh, um, whatever you might think about biblical myths we use in order to explain uh, what we are, who we are, why we are here, what we do, and how we think. So I am um, trying to undermine uh, those myths and asking a question, um, is it really so? Um, uh, uh, Barrett uh, mentioned today uh, that cotton uh, is high, um, uh, ref uh, referring uh, to, uh, to Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. So in Porgy and Bess, there is this famous um, um, uh, chorus uh, where they are uh, singing, it, it, ain't, it, it ain't necessarily so. So this is one of my mottos. It ain't necessarily so. Um, uh, so um, when I am thinking about myths that I'm undermining, um, um, and that I'm using, um, uh, of course, biblical myths are um, occupying the first and foremost place in my thinking. So uh, this is Babylonian Tower. Babylonian Tower that you know very well um, from the end of uh, Parashat Noah in, in, uh, in the book of Genesis. Um, um, uh, Jews uh, are, you know, before they are Jewish, uh, they are building um, Babylonian Tower uh, with its head that is trying to reach heavens. And everybody thinks the higher you get, uh, the more utopian the world uh, appears. Uh, but I am uh, using this particular myth to ponder not only um, um, uh, what does it mean to build um, a Babylonian Tower, but also what does it mean to build um, a new society, to build a new state, uh, to create an ideologically uh, vibrant uh, socialist uh, society. Um, of course, I'm a survivor of communism and uh, you know, um, communism is sitting in my liver. Um, um, I lived 30 years in a communist country. I know it inside out. Um, uh, so um, I am um, thinking out loud, what does it mean to be building this kind of a uh, uh, socialist society. And if you, um, again, uh, step aside, it's a big canvas, you need to look at it uh, from, um, uh, from some distance, uh, you'll realize that uh, this Babylonian tower, uh, you know, lo and behold, um, has uh, uh, the um, walls and the levels that uh, are reminiscent of the Kremlin wall. And of course, um, it is uh, not a random coincidence. Um, um, of course, the higher you go uh, up uh, the uh, uh, tower, the less freedom you have. And I'm using um, not only references to the construction of uh, socialism uh, under Stalin, but also direct references to the big biblical stories, because in Midrash, as you know, um, uh, the uh, Babylonian Tower is depicted as uh, um, a construction at which people uh, did not um, uh, have any value of the human life and people were killing themselves and thrown from the tower uh, for the sake of building it uh, up and up. Um, inscriptions on the tower are in Akkadian language. This is um, uh, genuine Akkadian language. Uh, the upper line says, we will bring it to He, meaning Van, um, and um, uh, the, uh, the lower uh, poster that the girl is holding says, 
to heaven. So uh, this idea of uh, constructing utopian world um, is conveyed uh, through um, Akkadian language uh, of the 25th century BCE that everybody recognizes, can read and knows. Um, uh, my uh, left-hand side picture is another uh, well-known myth, uh, 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 Pied Piper of Hamel, uh, the guy who saved the city of Hamel uh, from rats, and when he was not paid, he took his um, uh, flute and uh, moved all the kids uh, from the town, uh, bringing them to the um, uh, cave uh, in the hill where they were uh, hidden from the 12th century onward. Uh, the horrible story of the kids lured um, uh, from the town. So um, I'm using this uh, old German myth, uh, again, to ponder uh, the uh, communist myth that is uh, luring the children um, in the socialist country into something that I consider um, a cave um, in the um, hill. Um, uh, of course, they are celebrating their get together. Uh, they are rejoicing that they are finally, uh, you know, um, stretching their hand to uh, the humiliated and oppressed, but they do not know where they are going. Um, um, I am uh, one of them. I have my self-portrait uh, among uh, the crowd, um, uh, somewhere um, uh, in, the, in the crowd. But um, like uh, others, um, I pretend not to know where uh, the leader is taking us. Um, now, um, perhaps you realize that uh, although um, I like working with um, the um, acrylic, heavy body acrylic color uh, that creates an impression of uh, uh, this rough surface um, on the canvas. Um, I do translate 3D into 2D. So I'm trying to flatten uh, the uh, colors and I'm trying to flatten uh, the uh, um, uh, image of what I'm doing um, in order to tell um, um, in a simple way, a very complex story. So uh, my simple way is this 2D representation and the stories that I'm trying to create uh, um, uh, from my perspective challenge uh, received wisdom. We Johanna, were excuse yesterday. me for, yeah. for interrupting you, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanna give you a time warning because we wanna have a little time for questions. There are right. questions for right. you. I'm, okay. I, will, I will be done in two minutes, is it okay? okay. Sure. Okay, so uh, we were discussing Haggadah and coming out of Egypt. Uh, so um, uh, here you have something related to uh, Jews crossing the Red Sea. Um, and of course, uh, they are not crossing it, uh, um, you know, walking the bottom, they are crossing it in a paper um, um, ship uh, on which, uh, which is made, this paper ship is made of Shiratayam of uh, Miriam's song after crossing the ship. Uh, why so? Why it is my version of Exodus? Because, because I think Jews are always in the midst of Exodus that never finishes. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the Holy Land, the Promised Land is somewhere in the horizon that is not even seen. Um, I would like to um, end our conversation with uh, uh, this um, adoration of Magi uh, um, uh, picture uh, where I am bringing um, uh, modern um, um, uh, scientific um, discoveries um, and Christian myth and also very importantly, a uh, canonical Christian representation of Virgin Mary to whom uh, the Magi are coming to give their gifts. But instead of three Magi that are coming from Middle Asia, um, I have Marx, Freud, and, and Einstein who are bringing their gifts uh, to um, appease a baby. You know, on all these pictures, um, uh, baby Jesus is um, so happy, uh, uh, you know, so um, um, counterintuitively um, serious, uh, clever, um, uh, and wise. And I know that babies are crying as my, you know, 11 month daughter is doing right now in the first floor of the house. So uh, nobody is showing baby Jesus crying. So um, I am uh, kind of undermining Christian canon of um, representation of uh, adoration of Magi. And, and of course, uh, my Magi are bringing their um, um, artifacts, are bringing their uh, inventions. Uh, Freud with his uh, idiosyncratic cigar, uh, Marx with his red flag and, and Einstein with his um, model of, of Adam. Um, 
and of course, they do not appease baby Jesus. He is still crying. Um, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean uh, that they should not um, continue doing what they are doing. Uh, so um, this is what I would like to uh, share with you. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And uh, uh, basically, um, oh, I should end up by saying that uh, despite my heavy teaching uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, I am um, uh, trying to create art wherever I am in a very uncertain situation where I do not have an easel and I do not have an easel. I usually keep my uh, 48 to 48 um, uh, size canvas on my hand or put it uh, on a bookshelf um, uh, and uh, making sketches uh, wherever I am, uh, driving through Slovakia uh, or, uh, you know, being in an attic in a museum in Lviv where they gave me uh, a space uh, to do a big size canvas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. This was a fascinating journey. I love your uh how it goes from this uh, avant-garde poster to the communist red and uh, black drawings. It's fantastic. And there is some uh, time for questions, not so much, but please jump in. Cynthia, we had something to ask. Go ahead, Cynthia, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And before my question, I just wanna say, I really appreciate the way that you've limited your color palette and translated into flat, very, you're, 3D into 2D that still maintains 3D. Uh, but my question is that your stories are really incredible um, and I think a very important part of the work. And I wondered if you had thought about either collaboration with yourself, with your other half, with your scholar half, or with someone else. And I meant to write poet in the um, chat, but it came out with a different word, uh, a writer, or maybe invite comments. I mean, I just see this as, as, a, as a book in some way that would have the image and the text, so. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I was uh, thinking about the book uh, uh, since the get-go. I usually um, create my own um, uh, one, two line um, in, uh, captions uh, for my, um, um, for my artwork, uh, not to tell people what I'm trying to say, but to give them um, uh, some sort of a question that uh, helps them uh, to make a bridge, uh, create a bridge between them and the visual material. I did not include any of those uh, captions here uh, because you know we have my live voice. Why do you need my dead letters? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, several people, including um, a professor uh, in Slavic and art history here at North Northwestern, told me that I have to um, find a person who would create texts for my um, uh, for my um, canvases. Um, I even started to create a separate uh, series of works, none of which I showed, um, uh, taking, by taking uh, the Brothers Grimm uh, uh, tales, mm -hmm. creating my midrash on Brothers Grimm, um, and um, uh, thinking that, um, the, um, that, that, that a writer uh, interested in um, what I am doing visually would create uh, he's a her version of Brother Grimm stories um, that would be then put together uh, somebody's text and um, um, and my visual material, but it did not happen. Um, I'm trying to to entice uh, my sister, who is a German writer, best-selling writer, to do that with me. Uh, she is still thinking. I am asking her for already six years. Okay, I, I just wanted to add, I would see it more as poetry as something really brief because your images are so strong and I would be concerned if the text overpowers, but that's from my little perspective here. Thank you, Cynthia. If you, if you know this poet, uh, um, you know, um, at the end of this presentation, you see my email, so I would be more than happy to cooperate. I'll think of a few poets, but who knows? Okay, okay thank you. You can put your email in the in the email and uh, your website if you like on the chat, so everybody okay. can uh, just do yeah. it right now. So if anybody yeah. have any other question to Johanan or Eric, or welcome. There are questions in the um, in the chat, but I do not have time to read them. 
Yeah, um, let me just take a quick look. Um, Do we need to know the stories? If so, can they be incorporated into the presentation? Collaboration with a set writer. Yeah, oh, uh, Cynthia, this is this, yeah, this yeah, is- Yeah, and it wrote, it wrote set, I meant poet. I don't know how right, 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 right. Belchecker got from poet to set. Right. Basically, I'm working with the stories that are known. Um, um, if uh, people do not know the story, I give one, two sentence long um, context in my caption. Hannah had a question for both uh, Johanan and Barrett, it looks like. So Hannah, would you, Hannah Zalag, please unmute yourself? Well, first of all, I wanna thank um, Dorit and Judith for how you put together these two artists. And not only because I, they were from Chicago and I appreciate that, but um, they're both so related in a way. And I think it has to do with what Cynthia said about poetry. Um, you know, uh, Yochanan, your work, I don't know if you just chose this presentation, but it's so COVID related for right now. It's about so social chaos and, and, you know, this crossing over and getting, you know, the great re-entry back into society. And the only <clears throat> intimate part was these, this couple who's stuck in the house together. So it just, it just seems so perfect for today. But the thing that you both have in common is that you take these stories that are, you know, books and, and writing and you turn them into, you distill them into the very essence of what they are. So that's very poetic. And um, particularly Barrett, you weave, I mean, you weave these things that are all letters, you know, the book of Lamentations and the book of the liturgy and the book of the ghetto, you know, the Cairo Geniza, but particularly the book of Ruth because the holiday of Shavuot is coming up and we read the book of Ruth. And um, I noticed, okay, so this is the question. I noticed that there are a lot of shapes within the book of Ruth, particularly the one about the witnessing that you have the two things that look like tablets. And I'm just wondering if you chose that presentation because of the timing, both of you, that you chose, it's more of a meta question, like did you choose to do this presentation on this day because of what's going on right now? Or did you choose this because of, because the poetry just means something to you? So anyway, so that's why I asked Judith yeah. and Dorit because that's all related about with, you know, how you curated this program today. Thank you, Okay, so uh, Hannah has some high singer and thank you for your words. I just, um, I was a little confused there with the muting and unmuting. So let me just ask you, did you ask uh, specifically about that tapestry and then why did I choose to show uh, this series? Is that what you asked? Yeah, that one tapestry so, particular yeah. was so Shavuot related, especially because wow. the truth is yeah. coming up. So I want to know that. Right. So because of okay. because of both of your decision to do what you did today that yeah. is related to what's going on kind of in the in the kind of zeitgeist that just was yeah wondering. good so is there a chance I can share that uh, tapestry if I do share screen now do you there um, so I think I can talking share it. About? are we talking about uh, the Ruth series yes it's the um, yeah, I think the third last witness or one. fourth last. Yeah. Okay, let well, me. Fourth um, last in the root series, so everyone knows because that's a very interesting interpretation. That uh, tapestry and the, the colors don't mean anything in this series, but uh, the shapes do. So uh, the witnesses are old men at the city gate. It reminded yeah. me of the Ten Commandments, so that's what I. Right, the, the, you see the tablets and the, I see the old guests. And then this series was woven uh, around the time of the Me Too campaign. And we, uh, uh, or you know, all these stories coming up. And here we get one story after the other about these men in positions making uh, decisions. And uh, reading uh, this story, you know, the, the language is very minimal. It, and uh, background knowledge helps in interpreting the text. But of course, uh, personal experience plays in too. Uh, now, that was a way of uh, making decision at the time. That was not just special for Book of Ruth or, or, or for those people in that story. Uh, so the elderly and by the city gate. But I couldn't help but 
feeling uncomfortable, although there's nothing that alludes to that in that part of the story. There is another place where uh, it's alluded to men uh, attacking women. But I, I saw the yellow space. I'm sorry, but I wove it as a rat. And uh, the, the <laughs> it doesn't mean that it is a rat, it, uh, but uh, that's how that space came uh, uh, about. And now, why did I choose the series? Because um, I uh, wove it. Um, uh, I showed this tapestry a year ago at the public library in Oak Park and it was closed after 10 days. So that was the first time COVID really affected me. I've had a very productive year. Uh, it's been good work-wise, but uh, there have been other things too that I was scheduled to do and, uh, and it was all canceled, like for so many people. But I'm happy to say that I will be sharing this uh, series at Anshe Emmet in Chicago for Shavuot. It will be a Zoom event this year, but... Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you for participating. We we are over okay. the time, so we have thank to say goodbye. Thank you for participating in the Jewish Arts and Open Studios programming. This program will continue in May with our next series after the flood regenesis. Yeah. We will be announcing dates shortly, and we hope to see you then. So have a nice day wherever you are, and nice evening here in Israel. And see you very, very soon. We'll see you next month. Thank you, Yochanan and Barry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorit and Judith. Thank you. Okay. And Dorit and everyone. Thank you.